So thank you very much. And uh, we have a very, um, a hopefully interesting uh, <laughs> uh, roundtable discussion. Uh, this is something that um, has been on my mind a lot about uh, what do we have to say about uh, inflation from a heterodox perspective. Um, you, you know, the blog, the monetary blog, we talk a lot about inflation and we talk a lot about possible uh, fiscal policy responses. I think we're in agreement that central banks' monetary policy may not be the best uh, way tool to, to deal with inflation. So anyways, um, the, we've heard quite a lot about interest rate rules. I think I'll be doing a symposium on interest rate rules in an era of inflation. So there's a lot to discuss. And it's a question that I've been sort of grappling with for the past year. We've had a lot of exchanges and debates amongst ourselves. So I invited uh, two people, especially, uh, not especially, but um, we had a discussion on Twitter about profit-led inflation, and Matthias got very excited about that, angry and excited. And uh, so I thought, I thought that would be, a good, uh, a good debate will be between Matthias and Mark, and uh, I'm looking forward to this uh, to the discussion. So the way it's going to go, we've got about an hour and some left, an hour and 10 minutes left. You can each speak for 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. And hopefully we'll have some, some good questions and good discussion. The first speaker will be Mark Lavoie, uh, followed by uh, Matthias, and I'll let you know when you've got five minutes left. Uh, Okay. To speak. I'm not sure I'll be able to, to say what we should be doing, but uh, anyway, so I was asked to talk on this same topic at the beginning of July, so that's why I had a PowerPoint already uh, prepared. Um, so I'll start with what is not a cause of inflation. <laughs> uh, it's not caused by an excess creation of money. Uh, right now, it's funny because MMT is being blamed for the 8% rate of inflation that uh, there is in the United States. And so here you can read a statement that was found in some uh, blog. Uh, and certainly we can say that inflation is not caused by the large amount of reserves that we have uh, on, at, at the central bank. So I think everybody agrees on this. Uh, just to give you an, <laughs> an idea uh, of these uh, bank reserves, which have been multiplied by 1,000 in Canada in just a matter of a few months. That's this uh, row here. Uh, what might not be a cause of inflation, but which uh, may play some role is the fact that as was mentioned, I think by Mario this morning, uh, there, there have been many support programs uh, during the pandemic and Canada in particular. And as a result of that, households have large sums of savings, which they just could not spend in 2020-2021 and which they now try to spend. Uh, but since all countries seem to have the same rate of inflation, uh, at least in Europe and US, Canada, uh, so this could be doubtful. However, when you look at uh, this table, uh, you can. this is about uh, the household accounts you can see that uh, looking at disposable income, disposable income went up in the second quarter of 2020, which is rather <laughs> surprising, but that was because of the generosity of uh, our federal uh, support programs. And the other interesting row is when you look at saving, usually saving by households are around zero but they were uh, very large uh, in the, during 2020 and they couldn't really be spent in 2021. So one would think that they are being spent uh, to some extent now, maybe they were also used to pay back debt and so on. Uh, but 
anyway, this may be uh, a source of aggregate demand right now. Okay, the standard post Keynesian view of inflation is based on this sort of Kaleskian pricing equation. So if there is inflation, it's either due to an increase in the markup or an increase in the nominal wage rate compared to the rate of growth of labor productivity. But this would be in a closed economy and uh, we are in an open economy and we are in almost all countries are more open than they were than, than they ever were. Therefore, the importance of these imported materials for the domestic rate of inflation is greater than it has ever been. And so uh, we should add what happens to imported inputs. And, and in this case, if we do that, then we can see that the price is equal to one plus the, mar the markup rate times the unit labor cost plus the unit material cost. So assuming they come from abroad, then we can modify it in this way. So just playing around where J represents the unit material cost relative to the unit labor cost. Um, and so if, if this J goes up, and rewriting J as being equal to one plus, uh, well, capital J being equal to one plus J, then we can say that the rate of inflation is equal to the rate of growth of the markup plus the rate of growth of this external component, which as I said, is more and more important. And so, I believe that uh, to, to a large extent, the rate of inflation comes from this uh, capital J component. So you can say that this summarizes, you know, so if the, you can say, roughly speaking, there are three possible sources of inflation, an increase in the profit margins of firms, an increase in the uh, rate of growth of nominal wages relative to labor productivity, or a uh, rate of increase in this unit cost of imported material inputs, which was faster than that of labor uh, cost, and which has been passed on to, to consumers. So it may or may not be passed on, but according to the empirical research, uh, it is an accepted fact among post and economists that if there is an increase in unit cost, it will usually be passed on to, uh, to the consumers. Um, so uh, yeah, we know that as economy, economic activity picked up in 21, 2022, the prices of commodities did rise. Uh, we know also there was this rise in some components. Uh, probably everybody has been talking about the global supply chains, the fact that there's been the zero COVID policy in China, the rise in shipping costs, transportation costs. Uh, ships were being stuck in harbors, couldn't deliver the products. The, there was a rise in oil prices as activity picked up, and then there was the famous. Russian attack on Ukraine, so other uh, things uh, went up as well. So that certainly is a, a cause. Another uh, thing that has been discussed is uh, the rise in profit margins. So you, there are many uh, empirical studies which show that, yeah, corporate profits uh, are now, so the, the dark blue line is what has happened recently. The light blue line is what used to happen before. So we can see that, wow, it's mostly corporate profits, which seem to be the main cause. The other important one would be non-labor input cost. Uh, so how important is the contribution of uh, rising profit margin? Well, certainly we know that in some industries or sectors, 
uh, yeah, uh, for instance, with respect to gasoline and all that, the profit margins have risen. They have taken the opportunity to make more profits, but it's not so obvious in the other sectors. And the reason for this is, is this view of the cost and pricing of firms according to the post Keynesian view. So the way I see it is that uh, the, the firms are still setting the same profit margin, but their profit margin is based on normal unit cost. And if we have fixed, uh, lab un fixed labor cost, what will happen is that the, the, the realized profit margin will be larger when economic activity is speeding up and it will be smaller when uh, you have a recession. So for instance, 1983, 81, you because there was a recession going on as inflation was uh, high, you would expect a negative relationship between those two. Whereas in our current situation, uh, yeah, the, the apparent, the realized profit margins are much bigger than they were, but that's not necessarily because the firms are raising their profit margins on normal unit costs. It's simply because the rates of utilization, the level of sales are bigger than before and this explains why the apparent realized profit margins are higher so uh, apparently i'm uh, in some sort of agreement here with uh, matthias are wages the culprit well if you look at some this is for canada always uh, according to some you might believe that yes it, it's the culprit when you look at uh, about 2021 you can see that wow hey the the uh, average employee remuneration in Canada has risen by about eight or 10%. But the reason for this is simply a change in the structure of employment. So all those people that were working at minimal wages or close to minimum wages during the pandemic, they were laid off, they couldn't work anymore. All these restaurants were closed, retail shops and so on. And so the only people remaining were those that had white collar uh, jobs. And the few who were working at minimum salary, uh, they were working overtime. And so they were benefiting from overtime pay. And that explains why you have this jump here in 2021. And then it went back to uh, 2% until very recently where apparently it's more around five or six percent so the lesson of all this is that well roughly speaking the inflation comes from abroad it's a fault of the foreigners <laughs> <laughs> so it's not the firms it's not the wage earners uh so this is what i've been uh just uh, saying in a few words Okay, um, but uh, yeah, but the problem now is that uh, there may be a price wage spiral caused by rising prices and then wages try to pick up because this parameter here, J, ha is now bigger than it used to be. And therefore, even if firms set the same markup, uh, then what this means is that the real wage for a given productivity is falling. So, I mean, the, the union representatives or the workers, uh, the employees are going to try to catch up. And so there is this danger of this uh, rate of inflation will not necessarily come back to 2%. It may come back to 4 or 5%. But... Okay. Um, okay, how can the target inflation rate be achieved if we assume that we should go back to 2%? But of course, uh, perhaps the Bank of Canada should give up on 2% and 
just think, well, we are at 8%. If we come back at 4%, maybe it's good enough. But that's within the mandate of the bank. The bank says it should be between 1% and 3%. So, yeah, hopefully we can hope that the supply chains will get fixed up. We can hope that the Ukraine war will end up. Uh, and so this J parameter will uh, will decrease, and that should help inflation to go down. Uh, households will soon run out of excess liquidity, so they will have at some point they will achieve their target wealth to disposable income ratio. So they should should stop to spend more than they used to. And uh, yeah, obviously the central bank, I think will keep raising its target interest rates. Um, I, I, I mean, we had a small discussion about this. I, I do believe that current interest rates have been relatively slow since 2019 and even before, uh, except since the start of 2022. It's interesting to note that long-term rates of interest started moving up before the short-term rate of interest moved up. And then we have this uh, <laughs> rule that was... Uh, discussed by John Smithin and Steve Pressman. Well, a fair rate of interest ought to be equal to the growth rate of nominal wages. So if there is some advance in nominal wages around 5%, well, the nominal rate ought to be around 5%. Nominal interest rate also ought to be around 5%. Uh, should skip this. Uh, yeah, some people say the problem is the supply chains. Raising interest rates won't solve the problem of supply chains. Well, that's perfectly correct. Uh, one would believe uh, if you want to solve the problem of supply chains, you should do more investment, and <laughs> try to avoid the supply chains or improve the supply chains. Uh, however, uh, if, if there are bottlenecks, you could say that it's, well, it's, Simultaneously, it's because supply is too low, but demand is too high. So if you do reduce the demand, in my opinion, it will reduce to some extent the bottlenecks. Um, and uh, for sure, we know that raising interest rates will decrease aggregate demand, mainly through the construction industry, because people now don't have access to new uh, mortgages or less mortgages and it will also lower uh, the prices of financial assets uh, and also if all the main central banks raise interest rates well this will reduce global aggregate demand and so this will put less pressure on world commodity prices um, now the worry that we may have uh, i have the same uh, Philip's curve uh, that Mario presented uh, this morning. The, the, the problem is that um, if we are around here, it will take a, a very high interest rates, nominal and real, to push, uh, to push us towards this area of the Phillips curve where uh, the, the rate of inflation will start to decrease. If you are on a flat Phillips curve, even if you slow down the economy, it's not going to change the rate of inflation very much. And so that's the danger of being on a flat Phillips curve. It means that the central bank has to do a lot more than otherwise. OK, will there be a recession? Uh, I'm afraid there will be uh, because real wages are going down. If we believe that we are in a domestic-led, uh, domestic wage-led economy, then having lower real wages will have a negative effect on the economy. We know that uh, the pr housing prices are going down. The prices in the stock markets have already gone down. Uh, and we know that in the past, when we had those, uh, well, I call that it negative energy shocks, but in, this, in the meaning that it, they are energy shocks that push up the prices of energy 
that have a negative impact on the economy. Uh, we know that this happened in 73 and 79. We did not necessarily have a recession in 73. It was just a uh, stagflation. We got stagflation, which is probably for sure what we will get now. Um, governments with high debt ratios are likely to forego expansionary policies for fear of, uh, of debt ratio rising, despite all these MMT arguments that we hear. And uh, there's also a Steve Keen arguments that households in many countries also have high debt ratios, in particular in Canada. I think we have perhaps the highest one in the world. And so, um, so on the one hand, it says um, that the effect of rising interest rates is going to be very bad. On the other hand, it tells us that maybe the central bank will hesitate to keep on raising uh, interest rates to take into account the fact that the financial stability of the Canadian economy, Canadian housing market is not so good. So I think this is it, yes. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we may need a, uh, a, some assistance for a PowerPoint presentation, please. Yeah, it might be something. But I, uh, you can see, you said, oh, this is an old PowerPoint, and I put the attention on my paper. So that, I'm not going to use it fully, but, you know, I uh, wish another presentation. So I might use some slides and certain things. Some go. So, Matthias Zenango uh, is next. I, I'm, you know, again, this is, uh, I'm going to try to reflect a little bit on what, uh, on what Mark says, said, and, but moving in slightly different direction in, in some ways, at least I, I want to talk more about, uh, the effects of inflation in the periphery, which I think I can sort of, uh, say a couple of things or what I think it's different. I mean, if I had to simplify, I think what Mark in a, in a very, uh, and I think it tells people in general. So we're we're sort of against the idea of uh, hiking interest rates, uh, you know, and stopping demand because of these sort of effects it might have on the economy and and the little effects that it might have on stopping inflation. Whereas I think in the periphery and in certain places, in particular in the periphery, there might be significantly more reason for higher interest rates uh, in you know, in general, um, and. Anyhow, so I think that that's uh, that's uh, part of the story. I should say that uh, th this particular one is a very so the, the paper that I, uh, this is you know based on it is the inflation puzzle, which uh, was published by Catalyst. Uh, uh, although I wrote it at the end of last year, uh, it was published somewhere at the beginning of the year, and and that's what this comes from. But it's for a presentation in Argentina, so it does have. And Warren Mosler was there in Argentina uh, right before I was, so it, it does have some some punches on MMT. I should say he was very much against, I should say, hiking interest rates in 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 the case of Argentina, and I think that that's a, a significant mistake. But you know, but that's another story. So I, I think in the U.S. and I'm going to be very brief on this. I think we're more or less on the same page. You know, Louis Philippe wanted a debate on that. I think we're more or less on the same page with with uh, Mark on 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 the causes of inflation. So this this is not a lot. You know, my plan of the talk. I'm not going to follow that. But I think um, you, in the in the U.S. in advanced economists, you know, so I suppose in Canada there is a version of of this too. There there is a, a vision that it's the excesses of the recovery and so it's fiscal and it's too much demand and it's demand pool and, and don't get me wrong mark didn't put there as the possible sources of inflation but i think he wouldn't disagree i mean demand pool could happen so under certain circumstances you know you do have 
too much demand in the economy and you can have that that's the reason for inflation no doubt about that you can be beyond you know the capacity limit of the economy and i don't think it's the case now that's you know a debate to be had I, I i had some graphs here that try to justify and you know why i don't think the american economy uh is at full employment or beyond full employment uh, i don't think you know it, it was a fast recovery but you know in in short so i'm not going to show that uh, but you know we, we uh if we're more or less back where we were before the crisis but of course the before the crisis was a, a you know a position that was not particularly good so the economy wasn't despite the relatively low level of unemployment at full employment at that point or close to capacitization and you know in in the us there has been a trend of capacitization going down and you know there are different ways and you can interpret that of course there are some people that interpret that as a secular trend coming down i tend to be uh, among those that think that uh, it, it is not the trend that it's down. So there is nothing normal about what's going on. It's just that uh, we have had less pressure on demand in general over the last uh, 30 something years, 40 years, uh, I should say now. <laughs> and so I think that that's the cause of, of that. And so so I don't think that uh, that excess demand argument is correct. I also don't think that uh, the argument uh, which Robert Reich, I say the left here, you know, um, I'm thinking more of Robert Reich, but also in academia, Terrox people, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think Isabella Weber was the the one that got more uh, track on, on this particular argument that it was the, uh, you know, oligopolistic inflation is what, you know, it used to be called at least in, in Argentina, where that was a big debate back back when in the, in, in the, um, um 80s uh, and and uh, i you know again mark more or less uh, suggested the arguments of you know to give a simple example uh of a particular sector that has been crucial for uh, the acceleration of inflation which is the energy sector the prices of oil are determined in international markets uh the cost of production didn't change much for say american corporations in the energy sector uh the price went up Obviously, given the cost fixed, the margins of profit went up. The margins of profit went up, not as you know something that caused the inflation; is the result of inflation. And so, the causes are on the global shocks. That again, it doesn't. You know, I I think that there are other issues that we must uh, discuss in, in more detail. But I don't think I think I see this as a roundtable associated to policy issues. So, I think uh, part of the debate in Argentina, which dealt with uh, the theoretical issues of that, I think that there is also confusion between what are level uh, effects and what are um, rates of change. And so I think that the oligopolistic, which is not what appear here in the discussion with Mark. So uh, if you're going to suggest that the oligopolistic uh, sort of position uh, has an impact on 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 inflation, uh, I I would tend to suggest that that you know for a given you know if it's a change in the globalistic position yes you you'll have a, an increase in the markup and that would lead to you know an increase in prices but you know not necessarily and there is no reason to think that that would lead us uh, to inflationary pressure so so uh, in in the post Keynesian models the way I see it is it's the um, the desire that there's a difference between the desire markup. And the actual markup and that is essentially a discussion of conflict inflation and i'm perfectly fine with that discussion but i think that it shouldn't be confused with the um level effects i always give us an example it's here in the you know i'm gonna show this graph so th this is a graph that it's in the text and that's uh there is something incorrect here or is it in the other one no it's this is the correct one so it, it's prices you know inflation rate from 1866 to 20 uh 20 in, in this particular case uh, in the United States, 2001. So yeah, although it shows 2020 there. And and the period of, of uh, you know, of the Gilded Age, uh, which is here, uh, which is a period in which you have the surge in oligopolistic power in the American economy is a period of inflation. So, you know, I mean, yes, you, you could have inflation because if you have conflict and whatnot, you could have had that. That was a period in which the labor class wasn't particularly strong and couldn't, you know, sort of resist and there wasn't wage resistance and conflict in, in that sense. And there was an inflation. So the oligopolistic uh, sort of markets do not necessarily mean inflation i think we're all more or less on the same page then, on that so i don't i don't think it's i think it's less of a debate so i, I don't think uh, i was angry 
despite uh, Louis Philippe's uh, sort of comment. But you know, uh, uh, so so that's the story there. So I, I think uh, bo both arguments in, in the advanced economies I think are wrong. I think I'm I'm with Mark. I think it's essentially cost push inflation. Um, I think it has to do with you know. Um, the supply chain issues. I think it has to do with the energy costs and the food costs associated to also the war uh, in Ukraine. And, and the part of, I mean, the title for my paper was an inflationary puzzle. I, I didn't think I was puzzled, but you know, the editor uh, was Vivek Chiber is the editor. He's a sociologist, a very good guy. He, he changed the title. My, my title was, uh, you know, that 70 show. And my point was that it wasn't that 70 show. Uh, it, it is, it's why it's not the 70 show. So there, there is a beautiful paper by, I think Tobin that I have somewhere here in the New York Times. Yeah, and this is not the copy of the New York Times, it's in a book. But uh, Tobin said that there are three causes of inflation. Excess demand, uh, the shortages in price increases in important commodities, good cost push, and the wage price, wage spiral uh, and conflict. And he says, uh, we have two of those. We have B and C, uh, conflict and, and cost push in the 70s. My point is we have just cost push. We don't have conflict in advanced economies. So that's why overall I see this is not the 70s uh, and there is no, no justification for, for the higher rates. Uh, Mark is right that you know, it might have you know, effects on the snags there, but the cost of that is brutal and there is no reason uh, to really do um, to do that, in my view, that that's a significant mistake. So I, I wouldn't pursue um, um, that kind of policy. You ask me, what do you do under the circumstances in which you have cost push inflation and and um, and you know um, and not particularly a lot of conflict? I I think there is not much that can be done effectively. So I, I would disagree with, and I'm sure uh, Steve will bring up and discuss issues of of uh, fiscal policy as an, an instrument for this. I think. The, the effects of, of taxation on prices, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not against using them. I think that there are good things that can be done, you know, in reducing prices of medications and other things and whatnot, but I don't think it would have a significant impact on, you know, in, as compared to say, if this war goes for significantly longer and the effects of, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the little Srafian in me will say the basics. So the things that enter in the production of everything else, energy and food, you know, the impact of those is too too much to be sort of in my view. So I, again, not because I disagree conceptually with the idea, but you know, because I don't think it will have a significant effect. So what's the policy that is the best? I, I think the best thing that can be done under the circumstances at the end of the day is to try to recompose wages. So, you know, I always say people get really afraid with inflation. And, you know, there was all of this talk, whatever it was, more than 10 years ago when Blanchard said, oh, it should be for the target, not, not two. And I was like, who knows what's the difference between two and four or even two and eight? They cannot tell you. Part of what I said here, the classic paper that started that literature on what are the effects of high inflations on, you know, growth and whatnot by people at the World Bank, you know, Michael Bruno and, 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 and I forget the name of the guy that went to NYU, but... Uh, uh, student of lands so of all people at MIT, but very conservative guy. Um, and no, uh, what? Are all the students of land. Oh yes, in a sense we are very conservative. Yes, uh, Lance was such a conservative guy. Yeah, and uh, but you know uh, the, the, uh, the no, they couldn't find any effect of inflation about forty percent. And then somebody will say, "Oh, Matthias is advocating inflation of forty percent." No, well, not really, but you know. But what I'm saying is, they couldn't find anything above, you know, uh, 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 below forty percent that had any significant impact on any relevant macroeconomic variable. So why are we discussing if it's two, four, or eight? They don't know that eight will do significant damage to anybody other than workers that their wages are not following. The eight percent. So, what's the best solution? Try to get the eight percent for workers. That's the, I think, short-term thing that it's the best. So, uh, you know, uh, that seems to me uh, pushing for higher minimum wages. You know, and we'll say, but that's inflation. Like, yeah, but so what? You know, that 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 would be my my. So, I don't think it's significant. I think we're we're lost in a you know in inflation paranoia, that it's. Uh, nobody knows exactly why it's a problem, but you know we're going to kill the patient because you know. 
maybe this is important. Uh, so, so that's the part that I, I'm always puzzled uh, of these discussions. Very different story in the developing world. So, so this is not uh, this is not uh, uh, the same. I think, uh, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore. Once we move, uh, and I don't mean MMT Kansas. Uh, I mean, uh, you know. This is not the, the normal world uh, where the normal rules apply. And so um, for the most part, I think one of the peculiar things of the 21st century has been, uh, you know, the vanish. I mean, one can think uh, globally you know, of the vanishing of inflation and so on and so forth. And the great moderation has been uh, that. But I think more relevant uh, to think about the peculiarities of uh, it's something we were discussing in the morning, and you know, it's the low rates of interest and the effect that that had on on the periphery. It has allowed peripheral countries the very low negative real rates of interest in advanced economies in the United States, the key hegemonic country with the key hegemonic currency. Uh, you know, th those very low real rates uh, in the United States nominal rates, of course, uh, to uh, have allowed uh, you know countries that accumulated significant amounts of reserves. So that, that's the key sort of uh, you know variable here. So for those countries that accumulated significant amounts of reserves, they uh, managed to uh, de-dollarize significantly their um, their um, uh, balance of payments and and their debts. So th they're borrowing in domestic currencies. So they're living in a world that it's closer, if you want, to uh, the world of uh, functional finance or, or MMT, whatever you want to call it, in the sense that uh, the restrictions on growth uh, sort, of, sort of vanished in many ways, the external constraint on growth. So if you used to grow a lot and your external accounts, the real side or sometimes even the financial side, if you had opened up and deregulated, which many of us did. Uh, that you had capital flight, that you had current account deficits, and you were forced to in, get indebted in foreign currency. Now, under the current circumstances in the 21st century, that has not happened. And so there is space for growth. Doesn't mean that they will use it. We can talk in the questions. I'm not going to discuss that, whether Brazil, there are enough Brazilians in the room to, you know, uh, to discuss the question, whether you're going to grow or not. Brazil decided not to grow. So Brazil decided to commit suicide. And yeah, you know, by the way, Latin America is doing relatively fine when you look at growth and you exclude two countries, well, three. You exclude Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela, and you're fine. They're all growing relatively well. I mean, not fast, it's not great, but they're doing fine, three, four percent. Uh, Chile, Peru, you go down the list, Bolivia is doing really great. You know, uh, so it's it's the big, you know, Mexico, not so much, but Mexico is tied to the US in peculiar ways. But uh, but still Mexico is growing more or less the same as the US, two percent per year or so. You know, correct me if I'm Wrong with Guillermo there. So uh, Argentina and Brazil had just had a last decade, zero growth uh, in the last 10 years. So, so and very different reasons. And, and so uh, in the case of Brazil, um, it's, I don't know what's going on, but it's flickering there. Uh, it, uh, I don't know if you want to tell anybody, Philippe. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So uh, in the case in the case of uh, Argentina, the issue is exactly the, the one that I was uh, suggesting. We didn't accumulate reserves, and that what's the problem when you don't accumulate reserves? It's exactly that you you know really uh, are forced you know in many ways to uh, under the current circumstances to hike the interest rate. Why? Because Argentina has an inflation that you know we were talking with. Uh, I think using the Argentinian uh, story uh, to discuss, and I can sort of get rid of this because I, I don't think I have anything else that I wanted to show here. Uh, this is just about the capacitization in the USO, and it's a lot of stuff that Mark uh, had there. So, uh, so um, here's fine. Here's not flickering. So the Argentinian story is an, a story in which inflation was higher since. Uh, so it, it was very low in the '90s. Uh, you know that was under a convertibility plan. So the exchange rate was fixed. That ended up being unsustainable. Uh, eventually, um, the um, the economy collapsed, and and after that, inflation. Uh, once the economy recovered, and so on and so forth, inflation was slightly higher. So inflation, I think, was in in the low um, two digits. If you look at uh, fifteen percent, accelerated a little bit. When I was in the central bank, as I always say, when I was in the central bank, we had low inflation in Argentina. It was around twenty five percent. So uh, 
Uh, so now, now it's uh, uh, I, it's 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 the it's the confidence of markets, my friend. You see, markets. It's it's the confidence of markets. So serious serious economies at the central bank they bring confidence and calm markets down. So that's my theory, uh, and uh, and and inflation really gets out of hand um, and doubles. Uh, uh, in, in, at the end of 2015, 2016, they eliminated capital controls that had been imposed in Argentina in about uh, 2011 or so. Um, and, and that leads you know, uh, to a significant depreciation of the exchange rate. And of course, those, those count in terms of, uh, of uh, the, the sources of inflation. So going back to Mark and Mark's discussion of, of inflation causes, how, how much time do I have? Another five minutes. Okay, uh, so I'll I'll use this as a. Uh, so, Mark was suggesting you know, of the several things as I said. One, the one I, I will put here, and if you think in Tobin, it's the conflict one. And so, conflict may not be. I mean, somebody may say, well, even in countries like Argentina, conflict is sort of deflated, and it's not what it used to be. But in the context of devaluations that are large and significant, we're talking, you know, 30, 40% a year uh, on a sliding exchange rate, you know, and so on and so forth. At the beginning, it was less, you know, of course. Um, and inflation was lower. Uh, there is some recomposition of wages. That recomposition of wages, even if it's losing against inflation, and it's not losing at all times, but, you know, even if it's losing, depending on the government, if more conservative, less, you know, what unions can get and so on and so forth, that recomposition creates a spiral. It's not a wage price spiral. It's a, you know, wage exchange rate spiral. So that's in there in Argentina. Uh, and, and any country that doesn't have enough reserves um, will have that problem. Uh, and you have the exchange rate uh, going because you don't have reserves and everybody's betting that, you know, there'll be a depreciation. So expected depreciation plays a role here. And, you know, and then wage recomposition would lead to the need of further depreciation. So, so it, you know, we... It, it, it's a feedback mechanism that you know uh, that uh, leads to relatively high levels of inflation. So by, by 2015, Argentina inflation you know slides to 50 percent, uh, and and you know the difference is that at that point it was a conservative government that enters, and and this conservative government managed to uh, by giving everything that the you know vulture funds wanted to to sort of close the. Uh, the problems of Argentina in international capital markets. And, and in that particular case, what happened is there is an inflow of capital, significant amounts of capital get in, but no capital controls and relatively low rates of interest. So one characteristic of you know, many developing countries is that they did maintain low rates of interest. And that's my point. When I was at the central bank, my point was we need to hike the rate of interest, which you know, it's not what you would expect a sort of post keynesian Raffian person to go to the central bank to say, you know what you need? Let's hike the rate of interest. So I, you know, and part of the story is you don't hike the rate of interest, what you have is capital flight. If the depreciation of the dollar, the expected depreciation of the dollar is bigger than interest rate remuneration in pesos. Why would you hold pesos or peso denominated assets? Nobody does. So you cannot borrow in pesos and you end up that everybody goes to dollars. So the economy is dollarized anyways, like in the 90s, and you cannot escape this thing. So, so uh, in this particular case, you, you have that inflation really got out of hand. At this point, it is whatever. It's on its way to be 90% by the end of the year. So uh, they are hiking interest rates. Uh, my guess would be not enough. Uh, at the same time, they are accelerating depreciations. The acceleration of depreciations of the, you know, uh, of the problem peg that Argentina basically has is something that the IMF has uh, sort of, uh, to some extent, plus fiscal adjustment uh, sort of suggested. So the fiscal adjustment here is to reduce the demand side and, you know, the external needs of the Argentinian economy and might have an impact. I think it's at this point, it's already, you know, being cut anyway. So I don't think it's a relevant sort of thing, but, you know, but that's another discussion. Um, I think that the acceleration of depreciations go against the hiking of the rate of interest. So you hike the rate of interest to attract capital, but you, at the same time, accelerate depreciations, which, you know, again, you're comparing these two things, the depreciations, the expected depreciations, you know, and the interest rate are the two things you're looking at, whether you're going to hold dollars or hold pesos. So, you know, they're contradictory measures and not particularly useful. So 
Argentina is an extreme case, but uh, but it's valid in many developing countries. So my general uh, sort of argument would be in developing countries. So, uh, and again, the question of degree of this is the degree to which you hold reserves, the degree to which you know, you're able to and have been able to borrow in your own domestic currency. Uh, you know, uh, a high degree rate of interest uh, might be necessary uh, to, uh, among other things, uh, you know, not because I'm too concerned with inflation, although. 90%, 100% inflation does have significant effects. Uh, um, so it's on the range now that you know we can show it, you know, other things are collapsing. I don't think it's inflation and it's causing it, but you know, it, it indicates that things are really you know problematic on the macro sort of arena. Uh, I, I think that those countries must uh, you know increase the rate of interest. Uh, the question that the only last thing to say on this, uh, I don't think that that means necessarily because everybody, you know, that, you know, then comes on this, uh, comes with a very conventional view. Oh, you have your rate of interest, hence you have to have a recession. And that's not true. There are many things you can do that even with, you know, higher rates of interest, for example, Brazil, uh, to use here the counterexample of what's not being done, it could be done in Brazil. Higher rates of interest that Brazil has implemented recently, uh, you know, and has as a you know, result of that, held a little bit the exchange rate, and I think will have eventually impact on the exchange rate uh, um, on the you know, inflation levels. Uh, it's something that can be easily countered with expansionary fiscal policies and credit policy. So the first and second Lula government, uh, you know, have very high rates of interest, and the economy grew relatively fast. And part of that was you had relatively expansionary fiscal policy, plus a public bank that was providing credit, subsidized cheap for a series of um, you know, activities associated with the expansion of the economy. So can you grow with high rates of interest? Of course you can. So uh, I'm not saying it's ideal that we have to hike rates of interest. I mean, if we didn't need to, sure. But you know, given the circumstances, I think that that's the big difference between center and periphery. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I should ask Mark if he has any comments on Matthias' presentation. The only thing that came to my mind is that I, I believe that the worst combination is high rates of interest and large fiscal mm -hmm. deficits, because then it just keeps on driving up the debt ratio which is what we had in most countries uh, in the 1980s. That, that was exactly the situation. Uh, real rates of interest that were five, five, six percent, large fiscal deficits and, and debt. But Mark, most of that debt is in domestic currency. So I, I'm less afraid about, so high debt in domestic currency is not the same as high debt in foreign. It's, so it, I'm willing to yeah. leave with that one. Yeah, you know, that, that would be my point. So it's not that I, I don't agree. That's a fact. It's the other. Yeah, it's it's not that I am that I am afraid of it. It's that the conventional view. Uh, well, what happened then in the 1990s is that we had cuts in various uh, health and social services that were being imposed on the Canadian economy. So it, it led to a, a difficult situation for the ordinary person. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple of comments. I'll kickstart that discussion. Um, first of all, you mentioned uh, 40 percent uh, inflation maybe not being a problem. Stiglitz has said something very similar. He said inflation doesn't become a problem until it's about 25 percent. Um, second of all, you mentioned inflation paranoia. Why are we paranoid about inflation? Well, the powers that be are afraid of their wealth. Uh, so I think that's why they are paranoid about inflation. So they want low inflation. Uh, so, you know, I don't think the Bank of Canada is raising interest rates because the price of baguette is going up and we can't afford it, but because the wealth is going down. Um, two questions. Um, is how important is demand inflation? Or, you know, in general, and maybe currently. And the, last, and the second question is this I was in Berlin and I had dinner with uh, Eckert Hein, and he said to me, all inflation is always about conflict at the domestic level and the international level. It's all conflict. 
let's stop talking about demand pull, cost push, power conflict. I wonder if you can have your comments on those. And maybe I'll uh, take the advantage of uh, going to questions, Guillermo. Actually, I have one question for each. First, with perhaps uh, Matthias. Uh, he said that um, this common view of uh, profit or market inflation um, is basically based on, well, on uh, the rising oligopoly power by firms, and that could be uh, uh, impacting inflation. And then you you mentioned the graph where the guile in the guile edge, edge, where you have like large monopoly power, uh, monopolies and oligopoly power, then where you didn't have like this kind of inflation problem. And I, I believe well that uh, the, the, the arguments that are in favor of market inflation in the context of COVID, they are not, it's not that they are making the case that, that it's in of itself that, uh, that oligopoly uh, are, is triggering inflation, is that something is happening and this is giving the power and this power is, this increasing power is, is sort of temporary and caused by the COVID related issues. And that put uh, some uh, like corporations in a position to 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 uh, to to push inflation a bit up, like higher than that than without this kind of uh, situation. And that's what's your take on that. And then uh, to Mark, uh, just uh, the question on the graph of uh, unit cost and unit direct cost and 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 prices. Uh, what would you uh, say about like? Uh, what's like, like if you reach like full capacity utilization, then you have this thing that of rising um, like uh, cost and everything is goes up. But if you are not at full capacity, then you have you don't have this sort of price increments. I mean, you 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 cannot like see this uh, inflation unless you are at like full capacity. So for you, what would it be this kind of uh, threshold? When, when you would say there would be a, like a problem of, uh, of uh, capacity utilization. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the answers to those uh, comments and questions. You're, you're hooked up, right? You are. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it is on. Um, so, it is on. Uh, nobody's laughing. So, um, the the you know so question uh, you, your first question I, I do agree with the idea of paranoia I think you're right it's it's the, so it, it goes I I'll say the paranoia story your answer to paranoia gives some uh, support for Eckhart's uh, idea I also heard uh, Ariel Voskin in, in Argentina once uh, told me the exact same place that all inflation is conflict inflation and you know if you know if the paranoia is you know because you know it eats their you know their their you know their shares of income yes and that they suffer more you know in financial assets whatnot uh, I think that 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 uh, yeah. so the negative inflation is very rare that that would be my so I, I think that there are situations in which you have persistent overexpansion of demand normally it's war. I don't know any other circumstance uh, that you have something like that, but it has to be, you know, something really relevant, like Second World War, Vietnam War. I don't think even the Iraq War had an impact on the American economy. You know, it didn't affect uh, the great moderation. So war is the only circumstance in which are really, you know, um, um, close to, you know, a uh, situation in which demand pool inflation is relevant. Uh, somebody, you know, uh, uh, you know, Steve uh, complained that I didn't cite Keynes earlier on, so I'm going to cite Keynes. Keynes thought that during the war, you should be concerned about inflation. So how to pay for the war is exactly about that. And he was thinking about taxes. So here we're on the same page. I think that at that point, it would have been a relevant way of, uh, of doing that. So, um, but, you know, it's a rare phenomenon. So I, I don't think it's... Uh, so I, I see that point of conflict being relevant in the following sense. I think that shock, so Latin American structuralists, uh, going back to Juan Rayola Vázquez, you know, the, the great Mexican economist, uh, he used to say that, you know, he's in 56 talking in alternative economico about, uh, you know, uh, inflation in Mexico. And he says that there are two things, and, you know, it's 
shocks and propagation mechanisms. So demand pull cost pusher shocks. And from that point of view, sure, they bring prices up and it's not persistent. So if you're going to think about inflation, you have to think of the propagation mechanisms. And propagation mechanisms tend to be of you know, conflictive nature. So wage price spirals, uh, you know, exchange rate wage spirals and so on and so forth. So I think that, that in that sense, I think that that argument is yeah, essentially correct. I'm, am I going to say, oh, there's only, you know, conflict inflation? I don't know. You know, I'm willing to leave with, with cost push and demand pull too. So, you know, but um, and be ecumenical about the causes of inflation. But, you know, um, Guillermo's question. Uh, if, if that's the argument, I'm more than happy to live with that argument. So you're telling me, uh, well, we should do so. I mean, I'm not against doing something against uh, oligopolistic power, but not because of their cause of inflation, you see. Mind you, if you read carefully both, and again, I, I haven't seen anything academic on this. So the, the piece I read was Robert Reich on on uh, the garden, and he's very explicit that you know they're causing it. And I have to read it again, but I think Isabella says the same thing. Uh, maybe I'm being unfair. Um, you know, but I think the argument was, uh, you know, uh, they're hiking all of a sudden the markups as a result, and this is causing inflation. If that's the argument, I think that that argument doesn't hold water, you know, and um, so, but, you know, uh, but that's a different sort of discussion of whether, you know, uh, you know, your, your sort of counter that the argument is, is that uh, sh something should be done that they're taking advantage of a situation. I I'm perfectly fine with that. And you know, I have no, no particular sort of, uh, you know, uh, disagreement. Well, I, I have no disagreement with uh, what Matthias just said on, on, on all these questions. Uh, I think it's important to use the Kaleskian distinction between, you know, primary goods, mining and all that on the one hand and services and manufacturing on the other hand. So I think that demand inflation in those latter two sectors is, is very rare. I mean, very rare do we reach uh, full capacity. So that goes to your question. And... Uh, and, and therefore, uh, what happens is that we have either cost and, and therefore what happens is that the way demand interacts with rising prices is through this industries, uh, you know, food industries, uh, mining, all these commodities, those things are like oil are determined on world markets and they depend on global demand and they uh, they do not face a flat uh, unit cost curve uh, they at some point easily reached they face rising uh, unit cost and so this is how demand inflation plays in but it's at the world level and the Bank of Canada cannot do much on that. I mean, it, it's helpless. And just before we had the financial crisis in 2008, the prices of, uh, in Canada were going above 3%. And I was wondering, what is the Bank of Canada going to do? You know, <laughs> Are they going to be able to stop that when it's coming from outside? And then we had the financial crisis. So prices went back back inside the corridor one to three percent um do is everything a conflict inflation i'm not i mean are you sure i can't I said that exactly absolutely <laughs> absolutely well I, I i guess what he means is that if there is uh for instance a rise in imported uh, goods well as i showed this will have an impact a negative impact on real wages, and therefore uh, unions employees will want to catch back on on this because, as I said, if the cost unit costs are going up, firms will raise their prices because they want to keep, roughly speaking, uh, a, a, you know a, a relevant profit margin on their normal unit cost and therefore real wages will go down and so the, the, there goes the conflict. Uh, he was also saying that at the international level it's countries conflict in conflict with other countries. 
oil oil producing countries. So, anyways, I thought it was an interesting. Um, good. Uh, yeah. Before I just want to say that in Canada, I just want to plug the work at the Canadian Center for Policy Alternative and David McDonald, who has been doing some good work on, you know, this oligopolistic markup profit um, as well. So I just want to plug their, their excellent work. Anyone here again? Yes, one, and then two. Hey, um, I'm Deborah, a PhD student at Colorado State. Uh, thanks for your awesome presentations. My question is associated with this, you know, so why we have somewhat high inflation and the impact of that on exchange rates. Because um, in Brazil, we basically have this importing inflation from other countries because of the devaluation of our currency. Um, and then if you pair that with high interest rates, how that can create even more bottlenecks and uh, shortage of inputs in the sense that um, financial um, fluctuations are going to be more, are going to give more return than actually productive investment. Higher interest rates were in the US? No, uh, domestic higher interest so rates. Brazilian higher interest Yes, rates. yes. Uh, and um, create this inflation spiral together with small reproductive investment and important inflation at the same time. So how do you think that those things can go together or not? Hi, Mateus Garcelli from McMaster University. So that's me, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to unravel this logic of the oligopoly a little bit more, because it, it seems like what you're saying, Mateus, is that, uh, there's a shock in an external market, uh, increases one part of the cost of production, the rest of their cost of production doesn't go up. They pass this uh, increase to consumers, therefore they have larger profits. So the profits didn't cause inflation, but the you know nugget in the logic is they pass the uh, increase to the consumers. If they didn't have the power to pass the increase to the consumers, then there would be a buffer to this uh, external shock that wouldn't lead to uh, the ultimate thing, which is a, a consumer higher consumer price uh, uh, increase. So, so in that sense, it it caused inflation just as much as the external shock from that point of view. Thank you. Any. Other question before we go to the answer. John Smithin. Yeah, because it's for recording. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. And now, unfortunately, again, I had to miss some of the presentation because I had to step outside. But so this is kind of a general one, but I think it's interesting. Um, Matthias, you were mentioning about inflation and war. My question is this: uh, There's a war going on now, the Ukraine war. Yeah. What impact does the Ukraine war have on US, on US inflation, right? And for that matter, on Canadian inflation, in your view? And say, Mark, I'd like Mark to answer that question if possible. Thank you. So, uh, Matthias first, then Mark. Okay, so I have interesting questions. So, uh, Deborah first. Uh, so, let me see if I understood correctly. So, we're saying, uh, that the exchange rate uh, now um, is the mechanism by which we get foreign inflation, so the depreciation, fair enough, uh, uh, and that the interest rate hike would, uh, and I'm here guessing because I'm not sure uh, I understood, but you're saying that the interest rate hike would, um, despite the fact on the exchange rate, which would be, you know, presumably to, you know, uh, even the higher remuneration on domestic assets, you know, stabilize the exchange rate. Um, it would have a cost effect on on prices. It's via the cost effect, like uh, the old Gibson paradox and and stuff like that. So fair enough. So I'm a big fan of the existence of Gibson paradoxes. We have this morning some discussion of those. You know, uh, they the took effect really. You know, Keynes read this in a Banker's Magazine and misnamed it. You know Gibson paradox. It's unfair to Mr. Took, uh, which I'm a huge fan. I have a among my collection of old books, besides the third edition of Ricardo's Principles from 1821, I have an 1823 pamphlet from Mr. Thomas Took. Sure. Uh, yes, I, and yes, I am. His, my books Took is it's up there. It's you know when he passed away, Mark said you know the last of the great. Uh, British English political economist has passed away. So he was there in the founding of the political economy club and so on and so forth. No, no, Marx. 
Uh, I, I am a, a, a Marxist. Uh, so I've always been a Marxist. Um, but, uh, the, the point the point is uh, I don't think that those effects are particularly large. So so you know, you, you can sort of make so I think that they're there, but they're not particularly large. And and on the other hand, the effect of the on the exchange rate are significant and large. And because the positions can be very large. So think of Argentina as a counterexample. You know, you have these big devaluations, <laughs> the effects are humongous. And so sure, you know, and there are many other things. So I'm not that's why I said it. It's not like I'm yay higher rates of interest, but you know, it's uh, you know. So how high? Well, I think, for example, during Rula, we had it at some point, perhaps too high. Um, there are fiscal consequences. I'm less, you know. So I don't think that I, I think that the political use of the large debt is what's dangerous. In Europe, certainly, they did that to you know many of the European countries, but I don't think it's uh, you know being in domestic currency. I don't think it's a particular significant issue. So so. The one that you should be looking at is the debt in foreign, you know, currency because that one you you cannot service at will. So that, on that one you can default, and and that's the issue. So so that's one question. Uh, my first question. So yeah, if we really spread the semantics, so I, I mean, yeah, we, my point is, um, uh, look, sh sure, they can decide to reduce the uh, the price of oil. Again, my example is just a simple example. I'm not trying to say that it's all the cases. So th there might be cases in which in this inflationary case case there are people trying to recover markups so that there might be conflict i would call that conflict inflation they're trying to hike their markups to because they think that they lost something and so on and so forth but that's conflict inflation in my view so uh, if oil is priced internationally you know to expect that they're going to reduce the price of you know it seems to me to hope on a benevolence that you know it's so why did inflation go up because you had a shock you know so i don't think that the corporation you know I mean, to expect them to reduce, uh, it would be sort of, it seems to me, uh, an exaggeration. To call that oligopolistic, so again, I think of oligopolistic, and I might be, you know, too influenced by a particular, peculiar debate in Argentina. The, the notion that, you know, it is the oligopolistic structure per se. So if you have a more oligopolistic structure, you'll end up having, you know, because they have more power, more inflation. And that's not necessarily the case, you know, that, you know, that's what that figure tried to show is look, sometimes you have that, but if the reasons for conflict are not there, you end up having an environment in which you actually have deflation, like the, the Gilded Age. So, you know, and we actually, the second Gilded Age that we have been living through has been the era of great moderation, you know? Uh, so in many ways also was in an era of high inflation. So where was the era of relatively high inflation? It's the collapse of the, you know, of the Bretton Woods era of the, you know, the, you know, golden age of capitalism and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we did discuss uh, a little bit, uh, so, but that's fine. It's a good question. You know, I, I think it's important. I, 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 it wasn't what triggered, I think. So the inflation started before, so where the supply chain issues and you know all sorts of things i mean china closed down you know taiwan whoever it was that had a list a laundry list of things this morning uh, on on some of these issues it might have been you uh, even i don't know who uh, was yes it was steve so sorry yes uh, and so 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 i think that that's the so the question there it's how long it will you know i mean obviously if, if you're German, you should be concerned about this. You know, uh, it's sort of a, an important thing. And then, you know, if you're in the periphery too, why? Because it affects uh, energy prices on you know our, our central and and food prices. And you know, and food prices have consequences in, in places where there is food insecurity. You know, significant problems. So so those issues are also I think appear. So it's worse for for places in which you know you 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 have uh, those broader sort of developmental issues. Yeah, well, I I think it's an interesting question that you put, uh, John. But uh, I, I would need uh, soon to work for five years uh, on a stock flow consistent model of the global economy to be able to give you a proper answer. <laughs> so I, I will not try to do it. Uh, about the question put by Matthias, uh, I mean. The, w the way I see it is that when firms see that their unit costs are raising, are rising, sorry, they just think that it is fair to them to raise their prices. So I think even if we were in a highly competitive economy, uh, you would get the same result. They 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 would not. Well, but why, why, but why couldn't they get away with it if all the firms are doing the same? You know, that's uh, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes, yes. Oh, no, not you and enjoy. Uh, or, yeah. I see hands. Yeah, I had my hand earlier. I didn't see you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I mean, it's it's a murky thing about this, you know, the oligopolistic or not. I mean, even in a more competitive environment, if you see the upper evaluation of stocks going on, like in a grocery store, you know, I mean, all of a sudden you start seeing a decline in the number of products that are around. And I don't think it just happened like that, okay? Now, it could be because they were uh, trying to, what is it, divide up ration what was supposedly scarce. Or was it simply a way to get away with it almost, you know, by raising, you know, opportunistically these uh, prices? And if everybody starts doing that, you could argue that there is this kind of, you know, what do you call it, profit push or whatever you want to market push here, inflation. But, you know, I'm not going to hammer this one out. There's one question, though, uh, or comment, I don't know, it's a bit of both there, uh, with, uh, for Mark here, because I... I, I remember the first time I ever went to a post Keynesian conference was in 1977, that Davidson had organized at Rutgers. And one of the speakers, as Macopoulos was in there, it's about the Koletskin pricing stuff. And uh, it was John Burbage who turned your classical after he was a student there at McGill. And uh, John Burbage presented exactly this kind of, you know, the J thing there you know, that you had there. I mean, literally using the same symbol in Kolesky. And his, I mean, and the argument, I think, is that, I mean, I completely accept it here, except that, that the inflation of that period, let's say with that J thing there, uh, was reflecting the fact that there are you know, if you look at it in the, the, the usual traditional way that Kaletsky posed the question, there are cost-determined prices and there are demand-determined prices, right? So the primary product for Kaletsky would have been the demand-determined. Now, it's true that if you have a small producer producing grain type of thing, okay, that this would be a, a good way of seeing that it must be primarily because of uh, inelasticity of supply, okay? that will cause it, and therefore, if you shift the uh, demand, in a sense, it's going to push up the prices, okay? But what was happening during this time around, it's the fact that you get these kind of local supply chain problems, in a sense. You know, there are, it, it happens because of, it, you know, as I said, they close down Shanghai for two months, you're going to see a, some effect on the bloody supply there, you know? But it's a kind of temporary thing, you would think, you'd like to think, but if it keeps going that way, so it's it's not the, the idea of a primary prices being in the last because oil is not for me a competitive in, you know, example here at all, right? Uh, and even in the seventies, it wasn't already with OPEC and everything. But even the worst now, I would argue in a certain way. Uh, but more importantly, uh, it's the supply chain, and that I don't know if it fits that simple division. Okay, yeah, it's import prices filtering through, but it's not because of inelasticities here that are the classic kind of view of it, uh, a la Kaletsky at all, okay? And it's temporary things that happen in terms of supply, okay? That clearly they would have to go away at some point, you know? Anyways, it's just a commentary on that. Thank you, Joel, and then the last question to Linda. Okay. So, yeah, I guess my question for you both is like, so what are your recommendations? Like, you know, you're, you're saying how you feel like where you feel like inflation is coming from and what you think is right in terms of distribution and stuff. And we've been talking, you know, over the course of our breaks and stuff like that about like, where should we ha have our goal to be? Like, what should we be suggesting as a policy measure? So, I I mean, we're all in the room. We're all discussing it. It's something of serious importance to us. So where do you think the central bank should um, go in terms of its interest rate policy? And then also, like, in this current environment? And also, do you believe that using maybe fis targeted fiscal policies could help out in this situation the way that, you know, some have already been implemented in the U.S.? So that's my main question. Thank you, and then Linda. Yeah, I'm just sort of intrigued by this idea that inflation 
ultimately doesn't matter whether it's 2%, 4%, 8%. That's totally outside the mainstream of views, obviously. Um, I mean, out, uh, the mainstream of the public, I don't mean economists. Um, and, and Louis Philippe makes the point, it obviously impacts the rich. But I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about the impact on, on workers as well. I mean, clearly, if they can keep pace through rising wages, they're fine. But if they don't have that kind of labor power, is that, is that not a significant impact? Thank you. Let me just say that, yeah, I think inflation does have an impact on consumption. I see it when I go to groceries. But I'm saying this paranoia, to use Matthias's expression, of wanting to fight inflation is not because pasta is going up. It's because the wealth of the rentiers in real terms is going down. This is why I think, from a political economy perspective, central banks are so uh, adamant about fighting inflation. Well, yesterday we had several uh, presentations by some of the younger scholars that dealt precisely with this question. One in particular, uh, higher inflation, does it affect in a positive way or in a negative way the income inequality? Who is being hurt? And, and Steve in particular also talked about it. And uh, the answer is not obvious. And perhaps the answer is that higher inflation hurts both the poor, sec poor groups of, of our economy and the richest, but not so much the ones in between. So that seemed to be the, the consensus. Uh, so usually when the Bank of Canada says we have to fight inflation, they say it hurts the poor and we got to do something. Uh, in the past, uh, economists like uh, Caldor used to argue that uh, it was good to have a rate of inflation around 5 or 6% uh, because it would induce the firms to invest faster. Uh, the neoclassical argument is that it greases the wheels, but it's based on some neoclassical view that uh, there, there are rigidities in the economy, therefore it's good. This, and this is why we had the 2% rate of inflation rather than zero. Um, uh, and on the question of what policy uh, should we have, uh, that's, uh, that's a tough question. I, 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 <laughs> uh, I'm a bit like uh, John, uh, when John spoke, uh, I think it, or you said some, some comments yesterday, no, this morning, perhaps. <laughs> uh, when you, you said, well, uh, and this is to answer uh, Joël, uh, the problem is perhaps not so much what is going on now, but what the central bank didn't do over the last few years, that the, the rate of interest was just too low for too long. Uh, and the answer uh, was provided by someone uh, a few hours ago. Uh, well, it was you, <laughs> Matthias, <laughs> who said that because of neoliberal, uh, because of liberal, uh, liberalization of the financial financial markets, financial markets have become much more unstable unstable than before, and because of that, the central bank is keeping interest rates low so that the, there isn't any new problem in the financial markets. Uh, so uh, frankly, to tell you frankly, I don't, I don't know whether interest rates sh should keep up rising. If I believe in the Pazinetti rule, I would say yes. <laughs> uh, but certainly I can tell you that uh, they should have been much higher in the, in, in the recent past. Okay, so uh, uh, that somewhat connected Joel and Linda's question, and and you know, uh, uh, and in the way I gave the answer. So I did say what I thought of about this. I, my point was I don't think there is much that can be done. Uh, you know, my point was I don't think the fiscal uh, policies uh, are necessarily will have a significant impact. I'm not against them. So saying don't do them, sure. You know, I mean. But I don't think that that will have any significant. I mean, if, if the price of oil, let's say the war 
you know, gets worse and the price of oil jumps 30%, the impact of fiscal measures will be, by comparison, you know, irrelevant. So I don't think that that would uh, be significant. Um, it goes also to the question of, say, uh, um, price controls. That price controls require a certain type of uh, bureaucratic control of the economy that maybe China can do, uh, but certainly not the U.S. Uh, you know, we, we don't have the kind of structure that we used to have during the. Uh, and there are very good books, in, you know, on, on the history of that. Isabella does a very good job of discussing that both in the U.S. before and in the case of China. So I think that that's. But I think her own discussion shows why it's probably not particularly good in the United States at this point, and in Canada it wouldn't be, you know, particularly. I, I, I wouldn't think that it would be sort of a. a a significant, you know, but yeah, maybe it's open to the way, but I don't think uh, even the size of some of the shocks, I don't think it would be. No, no, fair enough. I, you know, I, I, again, you, you, you have to require a level of political commitment and organization. Then you have to be able to control those corporations. You know, I mean, it was different in the Second World War when you know GM was producing. Yes, but GM was producing. Airplanes, not not cars, and so for the private sector. So it's a different story. So I, I'm not sure. So my, my reply is, what do you have to do? Well, keep wages going up because that goes to the other thing. So once you look at inflation, and I know it's completely out of the common sense, but that's the thing. This has been drilled and drilled. That's why you know I call it inflation paranoia. This has been drilled. It's part of one of those things. Why are we all concerned with that? So I'll give you an answer that has you know, kind of different and probably shouldn't given that Canada, you know, uh, the, the passing of the Queen affects uh, Canadians in a way that it doesn't affect, uh, you know, the United States. But uh, there was a piece that written by David Graeber, the, the late David Graeber, that uh, wrote on uh, why, uh, you know, and it's based on Adam Smith, on why people, uh, you know, people naturally have empathy and, you know, why people, you know, uh, well, not, I don't know, we build, you know, we're, social animals, we have empathy and so on and so forth. And he says that one of the things about social organization, he says it's in Smith actually, you know, in the theory of moral sentiments, and I confess my complete lack of, uh, you know, my ignorance, and I never read the, the theory of moral sentiments. I did read, of course, the Wealth of Nations, but, and, you know, and what he says is that Smith says that uh, relations of master slave, boss, uh, employee, and so on and so forth, generate an asymmetry in which normally the one with power is incapable of uh, feeling empathy towards those at the bottom and the opposite tends to be exacerbated. And that perhaps this sort of, uh, you know, and I brought the queen, this sort of excess of sort of concern with the death of the queen is associated to one of the mechanisms by which the structures of power are maintained. And so, um, I would suggest that the inflation paranoia is one of those structures of power uh, you know, uh, that uh, allows the elites to keep, uh, you know, control over society. So we're trained to think that inflation is a terrible thing. I always ask my students, what do you think is worse, inflation or unemployment? And I ask that in different circumstances. Sometimes inflation is high, like now, most often it's, you know, inflation, unemployment that has been in my career, you know, sort of the issue. But, you know, it's amazing that even in periods in which inflation is not there, more than half say inflation is the biggest problem. And I always say, think of this. If you have inflation, and of course your basket of consumption is slightly different than the next guy, you know, more or less inflation is all the same. So you're not affected very differently from the other guy with inflation. I drive more than the other guy, so I'm affected slightly more than you know, the person that uses public transportation to some extent, because public transportation will use energy. But yeah. You know, uh, but unemployment is very divisive socially. You, you have employment, you don't have. We're a loser, you know, and we live in societies in which that divisiveness is sort of important. So the notion that we should be concerned with inflation in the same sort of sense that we're concerned with unemployment is absolutely absurd. But the fact that we have absolutely convinced everybody in the media that the inflation is sort of the most important macroeconomic problem that there is, is part of these structures of power. And I think one of the things I try to disabuse my students is that that's paranoia. And that's not a phenomenon of right now. I didn't mean it. we're now with inflation paranoia. We're always with inflation paranoia. People are afraid of inflation even with, with the great moderation. People are nuts. You know, what, what can I tell you? So, so I think that that's the sort of, and, and my answer to that was exactly, you know, it came, I, I brought that topic because my answer is, I don't think we have anything 
that it's really good to deal with inflation. And I think it's terrible to throw everybody in unemployment and cause severe you know, social damage that it has long-term implications. You're unemployed now for, let's say, 10 years, and you're in your 20s. The rest of your career will be sort of much worse than it could have been. So it has lasting impacts on the lives of people in ways that are sort of dramatic. So, so, so that's why I see those two things together. Yeah, let me just say a comment, and I'll go further, is not only that we accept that inflation is a problem, we accept that it's okay to have an employment, to create an employment to fight inflation. And that's why I wrote in the paper that monetary policy is class biased. Yeah. And, and one of those analogies, pain is necessary. So, you and know. Exactly. And then if, if you go to the writings of uh, Jerry Epstein about contesting terrain and vested interests, um, you know, it's, it, anyways, uh, I'll give the last comment to Steve. Is it a comment or a question? Great comment uh, uh, on the why is inflation bad. Uh, Bob Schiller from Yale uh, did a survey. He surveyed both people and economists, and he surveyed the ba them about inflation oh, and, and economists, and economists separate. Yes, well, for for a good reason. Oh, well, you, 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 you'll see, you'll, you'll, you'll see, you'll see why I separated the two at the end. Um, about inflation, why they hate inflation, how much do they hate inflation, do they hate inflation? Same for unemployment, and the results were just extremely different for um, uh, normal people and non-normal people like economists. Uh, economists all thought that inflation was horrible. Uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, unemployment was horrible. Uh, normal people thought that inflation was horrible. And the reason they did was they felt that somehow they were being cheated. They felt that their wages were going up. They deserved the higher wages. And then inflation was stealing that from them. Also, I would add that inflation is something that affects everyone. And that's why you see bad unemployment. If I'm, if I'm not unemployed. So, it's not from if there's good unemployment. This is part of the fiscal policy. Yeah. Well, thank you. We went over by 15 minutes, but I think it was well worth it. I, I, the, what I take from this is a comment from Matisse who he said he was wholly ignorant. Is that what you said? Or uh, really ignorant. Something like that. So uh, that's what we uh, take from this session. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much to both.